Hi there, back again, and what I'm doing here is I'm going to talk about brittle failure theories now. Let me scroll, right? Hopefully you've seen my first video where I talk about why we need ductile and brittle failure theories in the first place. And then the second one is ductile, because we usually do ductile first, just the way everyone does it. I don't know why, right? Brittle failure theories are a little different, but they, they're driving at the same thing. And the reason we need differences, of course, is because shear stress and yielding don't happen with brittle materials. A brittle material breaks, it doesn't stretch much, it just kind of breaks. It's done. It goes from it, 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 crack, done, right? Doesn't make all those sounds, but you get the picture. So the simplest thing to do is to say, well, let's base a theory on the maximum normal stress. So what the maximum normal stress theory says is that failure occurs... when the maximum magnitude of normal stress exceeds the ultimate stress. Now, is this intention or compression? Well, it depends, right? I said maximum magnitude of normal stress. So that means if I have 150 MPA in tension and negative 200 MPA in compression as my principal stresses, well, I'm going with the negative 200 because that's got a magnitude of 200 MPA, not 150, right? So what I then have as my, uh, as my, failure theory kind of written out mathematically, because that's the word version, right? Mathematically, what this turns into is magnitude of the maximum normal stress is bigger than what I'm going to call SUT. Again, you've seen my, if you've seen some of my videos, you know I use S's for strengths. S's are things you look up in a book, okay? So SUT is strength, ultimate, tension all it is sut or we can have magnitude of the minimum principal stress is bigger than the ultimate strength and compression and these are normally reported as positive numbers anyway if you really really want to be careful about this and i will i'll just put absolute values around everything right so when either of those happens we get failure, okay? So, hmm, what does that mean for us if I have two principal stresses in a plane, right? I have a state of plane stress. I've got sigma P1, sigma P2. I'm avoiding using sigma 1, sigma 3, that kind of thing, because you normally think sigma 1 bigger than sigma 2, bigger than sigma 3. I don't want that here, okay? I'm going to have these two principal stresses in the plane, one and two. One can be bigger than two, two can be bigger than one. Don't care, right? It's just how they turn out at a particular point. And I'll have SUT, sorry, up there. I'll have SUT down he over here, minus SUC over here, minus SUC over here. We're making an assumption here, by the way. This works when the ultimate strength and tension is pretty much the same as the ultimate strength and compression. We want that within maybe a few percent, right? That's what we're after here. So then what happens? What does this failure surface look like? Well, I'm going to get failure when the biggest principal stress from over on the right here, well, is bigger than SUT. That sounds to me like there's a line here, right? And once I get to this corner... Well, then sigma P2 would be bigger than sigma P1. So I got to walk in along this direction. And I actually have to walk in along this direction. And hopefully you're seeing what the shape is going to be. Within the limits of my drawing, if SUT equals SUC, this is a square, right? And any of these red X's, you see this put together. Well, those are points where we predict failure. And if we have a stress state like one of these inside with those two principal stresses, those are safe, okay? 
what if I wanted a factor of safety? Well, my factor of safety, I've heard some people call it allowable over actual. One of the people I work with likes to call it that. I prefer strength over stress, right? Because then it's going to be SUT over my maximum or FS is equal ultimate strength and compression over the minimum. Either way, that's my factor of safety. What you do is you choose the one that gives you the smaller number, right? That's what it's going to turn into. All right. So what we do typically is we look for which, which, which way we go, which one we need, right? In this case, because SUT and SUC are the same, if sigma max is a bigger magnitude than sigma min, well, then we go with the one, the, the equation on the left. If sigma min has a bigger magnitude than sigma max, we go with the one on the right. Again, you got to think your way through and figure out which one you need for that particular case. All right. This is the most dead baby simple figure theory I think you can come up with. It works for a lot of brittle materials. It's fine because that's how brittle materials fail. And it worked. It's great. But what if SUT is not about equal to SUC? That little thing I have in purple on the right. What if that's not true? We have a theory for that too, oddly enough, right? Probably wouldn't ask the question if I didn't have an answer available for you. If SUT is not equal to SUC, we have something else called Coulomb-Moore theory. Yes, it's the same Bohr as the circle. Let me get that out there right now. It's good old Otto. All right. So what does this really mean, right? to have SUT not equal to SUC. Is this really something that happens all that often? Uh-huh, right? There's a very common material, two, that I'm pretty sure you've used both of them recently, although used in some sense in one of these isn't gonna be the same sense you might be thinking of it. Think of concrete. It's got a very, very good ultimate strength and compression, and it's very much rubbish in tension, right? Think about a sidewalk. All right, you have a sidewalk in front of your house or something, winter comes, the ground frosts, and it heaves. And the concrete does this, and it cracks on the top side. Go figure, right? Another material that you've used that does this is bone. Yep, how often are bones in compression, right? Think about leg bones when someone's walking very much in compression. Right now, my spine's getting compressed. I'm sitting in a seat, right? They're all being compressed. And when bones break, they often break because of tension. I'm holding up my arm thinking, hmm, what if I landed on the ground like this on like a stick with all my weight? I would put my arm in bending, one that would really, really hurt, and two, if probably break on this side, side that's in tension. Go figure, right? So there are a lot of engineering materials, and you can think of bone as one of them, that have a much higher ultimate strength in tension than in compression. And again, we're dealing with a brittle material, so we don't care about yielding. The yield doesn't happen. We don't usually have yield strengths even available for these things. We deal with the ultimate strength in tension or compression. So Coulomb-Moore theory, the best way to explain this is again to think in terms of those principal stresses in the plane. If we have a state of plane stress, and I've got these two principal stresses, sigma P1, sigma P2, one is bigger than the other, don't care, right? So if I think about the case where I have both of these bigger than zero, it makes some sense that my failure surface should look a bit like that, right? When I see the ultimate strength, bad things are going to happen. That's area one. I come down here next. And what I'm going to do, actually, I might erase too much on this. I thought that might have happened, right? I need to redraw my uh, my horizontal axis, but that doesn't take more than a second, right? Because what I really want to do is I want to highlight that usually these materials, this class of material, if it's going to have the ultimate strength and compression different than the ultimate strength and tension, the one in compression is usually a lot bigger. So I don't want to draw this to even look like it's close to the same I want to put negative SUC out there. I'm going to scroll down a little more, give myself some more room. 
because I also want to extend my green, my vertical axis downward, I should say, and put minus SUC there. Why am I using minus SUC? The ultimate strength of compression, isn't it negative already? Usually when you look it up at a table, no, actually it isn't. They give you a positive number. I don't know either, right? So I'll put negative SUC there. And it makes sense that if both these principal stresses are negative, well, why shouldn't that look like a square? And Kulam and Moore kind of sat and stared at this and said, well, what do we do about what's in the middle? And they came up with the simplest solution they could think of. God bless them. They connected them with lines. We get another kite shape. We'll call that area three, region three, if you will. So what is my failure criteria? What do my failure criteria I should say look like for these different areas? Case one, what I would do is I would take the bigger of sigma p1 and sigma p2, the bigger in terms of a number line sense, right? And I'd say, all right, well, for case one, if they're both positive, if sigma p1 and sigma p2 are both bigger than zero, and I'm not saying which one's bigger than the other, I'm not saying one is bigger than the other, right? Then my failure criterion is quite simply sigma max is bigger than SUT. That's it, right? Isn't that easy? That's like the maximum normal stress theory. It is like the maximum normal stress theory, right? So my factor of safety is then SUT over sigma max. That's easy. Case two is not bad either because it's again, maximum normal stress theory all over again, right? Case two, that's both of them less than zero, okay? And what we're gonna find then is we're gonna say, well, we're going to have failure when the magnitude of sigma min is bigger than the magnitude of SUC. And that's my failure criterion. What's my factor of safety? Well, that's going to be magnitude of SUC over magnitude of sigma min. And again, it looks easy. It looks like maximum normal stress theory. Great. Case three, and I drew both these threes the same. They are slightly different. One of them... The case three on top is sigma p2 bigger than zero, sigma p1 less than zero. The one on the bottom is sigma p1 bigger than zero, sigma p2 less than zero. But we get to the same equation. So it doesn't much matter which one I look at. I'm going to arbitrarily look at the one where sigma p1 is bigger than zero, but this works for the other one as well. Okay. So really to be 100% clear about that, as I like to be, I'm going to knock that three out of here. And we'll just think of it as being the same thing later on, right? So this case, the way we drew it, we're going to have sigma P1, which is bigger than zero, which is bigger than sigma P2. Okay, now what? Well, it's a line, right? It's the equation of a line. Y equals MX plus B. So we can say along that line, sigma P2 is equal to SUC over SUT sigma P1 minus SUC. That's actually the line that we follow down here. So what we can say then is after some rearrangement, rearranging the, I got caught between re re rearrangement and rearranging, We manipulate a few things around and what we find really the way we rearrange divide both sides by suc right and then bring the and then bring the negative one that we get out of it to the to the left bring the sigma p2 term to the right we get that sigma p1 over sut minus sigma p2 over suc equals one is our failure criterion. 
this is what we say we have failure when that equation is true when we get to sigma p1 over sut minus sigma p2 over suc no i did not forget absolute value signs having a negative value on sigma p2 here hurts you having a positive principal stress and tension and negative and sorry one positive one negative principal stress there's the phrase that hurts you in this case that's by design that's a feature right they both interplay and when that total gets to be one then we have issues okay so what's our factor of safety i've been calling it fs i've never actually written factor of safety out in this video but hopefully you've seen the seen that factors of safety before right so what we're going to have to have is sigma p1 over sut minus sigma p2 over suc equals one over my factor of safety that's what this turns out to be right so and you can come up with that if you think about the other two right we could rearrange this factor of safety equation to say sigma min is equal to suc over fs right or you can think about this each of these two terms here for case one and case two they're the inverses of the terms that lined up in the case three so this just makes a lot of sense so we can solve this for factor of safety and our factor of safety is equal to sigma p1 over sut minus sigma p2 over suc all to the minus one do not do not do not under any circumstances just flip those two fractions individually and think you're getting somewhere no math doesn't work that way please don't break math math doesn't respond well to being broken okay so this is what our factor of safety equation is and this is all we need right these are the brittle failure criteria that we have one of them works very well if we have our uh if we have our ultimate strengths and tension and compression just about the same if we don't no need to panic we just need to add something that has three cases versus two no worries right and again this is all based on breaking due to tension not shear we're not going to break it 45 degrees we're going to break it 90 degrees perpendicular like we chopped a knife through it and that's the consequence is now our focus goes from being on yielding and shear stresses for the ductile materials the previous video to this time it was all about normal stresses and ultimate strengths things breaking things fracturing versus things yielding and deforming permanently okay so hopefully you got something out of this and see you all next time